Good morning. Thank you for joining us for another day to look at the headlines. We call this program Off the Press. My name is Felicity Ezi. We am joined by two guests this morning. In the studio, we have legal practitioner Libora Soshoma. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And we have joining us virtually Aisha Osori, public affairs analyst. Pleasure to have you with us on the program. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we kick things off this morning with the Tribune newspaper. Let's see what the screamer is. NAS won't back down on NDDC probe that, according to the Senate, it has one rider. Uh, dares commission uh, to provide corruption evidence against lawmakers to EFCC, ICPC. Um, there you have it on your screen now. Uh, just minute it, you have the outrage trails debt of Uniband student gang raped inside church. Uh, Baseki orders police investigation. Amnesty International laments killing high rape crimes in Nigeria. Um, let, let's um, um, skip that NDDC story and look at the other out, the one that has outrage. Aisha, I, I want to start with you. Um, what's your reaction to Amnesty lamenting the high rape crimes in Nigeria? This is one too many, isn't it? Yes, indeed, Felicity. <sighs> yeah, I don't know where. Uh, I think last year, we had, the Women of Nigeria had a, 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 a conference for putting together the manifesto. And dealing with sexual gender-based violence, violence against women, was one of the key points that were made. And in fact, there was a promise to declare a state of emergency, which I understand that the Ministry of Women Affairs has actually tried to lead, but has not gotten the support of the federal government. So it, it is very frustrating that this continues to happen is a sense of impunity against across the entire country. In addition to the hashtag for this young lady, uh, Justice for Uwa, I think last week there was killing of a 16-year-old girl by the Nigerian police. There are stories in the press for, about a man who chopped off his wife's hand in somewhere in the north, maybe Yobe, because she went for a wedding. Uh, there's the gang rape of a 12-year-old by 11 men in Amfara. You know, so the stories are on on and continuous and unrelenting, and people are getting quite frustrated. It is very, very clear that the societal collaboration, so to speak, about you know keeping violence against women and girls, something that we acknowledge that it happens, but we don't want to actually deal with it in a way that will prevent and that will manage things better. So it's actually really frustrating. For me, the way out is for the federal government to heed the call of the Minister, Minister of Women Affairs, uh, Pauline Talent, who has asked for a state of the emergency to be declared. But it's not enough to do just that. We also need funding. How do you fight violence against women and girls without any funding, not just for the police, but also for civil society, for the courts, for, for um, health, uh, for education, for behavioral change, communication? All that is required. I would say that with this return of the Abacha loot, where we say we're going to spend most of that on education and health, that's great. I think a portion of that should go to do with violence against women and girls. We need to go beyond the talk and the outrage to some concrete actions. Okay, uh, talking about, before we talk about concrete action, let me quickly um, get a clarification. I think that the story on the um, 11 men was not gang rape, but she was raped individually at different times uh, by okay. those, those people. So we need to clear that up quickly. Uh, before I go ahead and ask you what optimism you have that this investigation that's been ordered, all eyes on a dose stage, it, will it help? expedite uh, the course of justice or are we going to just you know see the, this one end as others have no i two things i think for sure the outrage the internet with the many celebrities picking up on the case and, you know tweeting it the fact that the rcgp head uh, and the governor will come out i think something will be done but what i'm worried about is this piecemeal management what is really a what terrence is called a shadow pandemic. You know, we all know that around the world, violence against women and girls is rising because of the pandemic. But the truth is, in Nigeria, we've lived with this shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls for a long time. We managed to successfully pass the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. We've had a few states who have actually adopted the act, at all. but it's still not national law. We still need two thirds of the 30 states to adopt that. So 
out I'm optimistic that this particular case who was family and loved one might get is very likely. Okay. But it's not enough to get justice for one person. Just All right, uh, the, the, the line is freezing up, so let's just um, relax a bit from it and come to Liberos in the studio. We'll get back to you in a bit, Aisha. Uh, let's look at the NAS saying that they won't back down on the NDDC probe. Does this reassure you maybe for once there is no smoke? They said there's smoke without fire. I mean, there is no smoke without fire. There is no smoke yeah, and there is but, no fire. Uh, sorry, quickly, before I answer your question, let me quickly take a bite on, uh, because that's my state okay. um, on the case of uh, UWA. Um, I see everybody, you know, tweeting it, latching onto it, including politicians using it now as a campaign tool to show that they are sensitive to the plight of the people. It's, it's, um, it's shameful, it's disgraceful, it is something that shouldn't be encouraged, shouldn't be allowed to happen in a sane society. And those people and people like that should be fished out wherever they are. But it's not enough to just say fish out. Even as I speak now, um, a former commissioner in Edo State was kidnapped, and as, we, as, as uh, if what we hear is to be believed, he's been killed, his decomposing body was found, you know, somewhere around his village. A former commissioner, a current commissioner, who was, who happened to be, you know, one of my lecturers before now was kidnapped also by kidnappers in the state. And so the state of insecurity in the state is, you know, it's, um, it's not something, it, it's very high. And as we speak, they are going into elections. Um, this is the case of Uwa. If Uwa were probably not killed, the case wouldn't have, you know, seen... Escalated. The, uh, seen the light of the day. wouldn't have been escalated to this level. So many young girls in Nigeria who are <coughs> either gang raped or raped, and including some who are selling on the street daily and nobody's talking about them. This is something not just for the Minister of Women Affairs. I think the federal government, state governors, commissioners of police should be empowered to deal with this case decisively so that we reduce it. And then, quickly, um, going to the issue of um, the, the NDDC assembly. probe. It's unfortunate that the NDDC has become a cesspool of corruption in Nigeria. Um, the same, the, the NDDC is also going the way of um, Umpadek, if you remember. Uh, now, the Interim Management Committee ordinarily was, you know, set up to clean the urgent table. But unfortunately, even the Interim Management Committee now is a mesh in, you know, fraud and controversy. The Interim Management Committee fired the first salvo by, you know, um, alleged that some senators we awarded contract to the executor execute and they collected mobilization up front. Now the Senate had said, had called on the Interim Management Committee, uh, as I stated by Dr. Karo Jubo, to come up with um, documents to substantiate the allegation. And that if these allegations were to stop the, uh, the National Assembly's oversight function and they were still going to go ahead with it. I also expect that the president should not just fold his hand and allow this back and forth. This is an institution that is meant to develop the Niger Delta, but since inception has been emerged, has been, you know, a, 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 an institution for enhancing corruption, rather, you know, for members of uh, the ruling party at every given time. And it is quite unfortunate. Quite unfortunate a development there, as you said. Um, still on the Nigerian Tribune, I'll just run through some of the headlines and then um, maybe um, Aisha will take on one before we move on to the next paper. Uh, the other stories here, just beside the outrage um, over the death of the Unibrand student, we have Ondo Guba. I am not afraid to direct of direct primaries. That's uh, Kere Dolu. A return to round table or face consequences, uh, federal government tells striking lecturers. We also have how police mobile force 72 squadron uh, was sighted in Okeogun, that's the Oyo. Um, uh, police, we have more. Police arrest Salawa Abeni's 19 year old blackmailer. And then Umar wants Buhari over skewed appointments. That's uh, another one for you. If you go to the top of the paper, you see the story on bandits kill APC chairman, uh, 13 others in Kat Sinna. Uh, I'll just leave it there and just um, let me go to Aisha quickly. Um, which of these headlines would you want to pick on? I think I missed a few more there, but loads of um, stories for you. Well, I like the, the story. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. 
I like the story on uh, Omar Dangiwa's letter to the president because it's something that obviously has been a theme across the last five years of the Buhari administration, and it's coming timed for the fifth anniversary of his presidency. So for me, the story behind all this is that we really need to relook at what federal character means. We de it's definitely an understanding that we definitely need our appointments, our governance to be inclusive to be representative of the diversity that Nigeria represents. So it's not even just character in federal character when we talk about ethnicity and the states of representation. It should also go beyond that small category of representation to gender, to youth, yeah. to people that live with disabilities. It's not just who is a Muslim and who is from, the, yeah. from this state or that state, which is what it has become. But beyond all that, too, I would like to say that, honestly, as a society, we need to reflect we need to sit down and talk about this culture of prebendalism, which is not something that started within the Buhari administration. It's not to give them a free pass. But even within the common man, there's this sense that if a person is in office, they must do for their people, in yeah. quotes. But the truth is, when you look around Nigeria, nobody has done for their people. There's not a single state in Nigeria that we can say is the Dubai of, or, or, of the world That's or true. the Singapore of the world. So what has it even meant when you have a governor of, of maybe Cross River that is from Cross River or a governor from Kogi that is from Kogi? It hasn't done anything from the people. So we as a society actually have to sit down and talk about, do we re is this what is really important or is it a distraction? in the conversations that we have. And then just very quickly to touch on the APC bandit, just and also talk about Libera's point. Um, we, we, we actually need to uh, check, or you have to do that in about 30 seconds so we can get on to security another paper. Security in Nigeria is actually a business now. It's a $20 million industry, apparently, especially kidnapping. So I'm just saying, that putting the insecurity in context, there's also a political economy around it that needs to be tackled. All right, we go to the Nation newspaper. Uh, federal government hands over COVID-19 battle to states. That's the big one. Uh, two riders. Buhari's decision on schools, worship centers expected. Uh, 20 local government areas account for 60% of cases. Um, not so, so great news um, about the uh, cases. Uh, we also have um, at the top of the paper, just above the masthead, uh, government to invoke labor law on lecturers we don't seem to have an end um, soon. And then we also have um, something on tensions in Senate over 2020 budget. We know that they are going to take a look at it um, to ensure the adjustment in line with our current realities are implemented. Uh, police man kills colleague in shooting spree. That's another one. Terrible to governors, primaries crucial to democracy. Okay, let's um, take a look at the big one. Federal government hands over COVID-19 battle to states. Uh, what, what's your take on it? Uh, yeah, uh, I have been um, an advocate of allowing the state and local governments to manage, um, you know, the crisis because um, you can't sit in Abuja and know what happens, what's happening everywhere. But as, it's, as, it, as uh, uh, it is now, um, what we have at the states, you know, is a far cry from management. You know, somebody asked jokingly, why is it that when the numbers were high, they were low, we locked down, and now that the numbers are, are, are getting higher every day, Lagos today was 188, yesterday was about 300 and something, and now that the numbers are getting higher, it's as if the states are fatigued, you know, and so we are even contemplating opening the entire economy. What are we doing now that we were not doing before? We, records have shown that, you know, what we were even doing before now was, you know, far better. And then if you look at the numbers, now we just hit above 10,000. Uh, mortality rate is about uh, 2 point something percent. Why recovery rate is about 3 point something percent. So that means there's still a wide gap of um, about five point something percent. And so um, that gap, until we're able to bridge the gap, I think um, the states should step up their, um, their uh, treatment and, and testing. We're still very far behind in terms of testing. And all of these ad hoc uh, facilities that we have scattered everywhere, you know, how also do we intend to make them permanent? All right, look, we'll jump to the Punch newspaper. Um, um, Aisha, uh, there's a story on states to handle cases. NMA demands compliance from churches, mosques. Uh, PTF says Nigeria approaching phase two, cases past 10,000. Uh, Buhari to decide on curfew, churches, mosques reopening today. Let's start with that. Yeah, with the states, uh, for me, I think that while states can take over the management of COVID-19 response, they, the WHO has established exit guidelines 
So it's true. The question about why are we opening now when the numbers are going up, for me, the key question is, one, has, is transmission under control? So what is our R rate? That's the rate of, of infecting other people. When one person, how many people do they infect? It's hard to know this, but do we know it? We should know it before we move into the, the full yes, exit of our lockdown. The second thing is the capacity of the health systems. Are they sufficiently built? Are we ready? It sounds like only Lagos and FCT is ready, but maybe other states are. But it would be good for us to know where the states are and outline this. In, in a way, the, the federal government can just relinquish control to the states without setting guidelines for how this exit is managed. And then we must also identify the hotspots. It sounds like Lagos is a hotspot right now, but within Lagos, where are we seeing the predominance of infections? And what preventative measures are going to be put in schools? We've seen that in South Korea, even though they opened up schools, they recently had to run, run, call, recall this, this uh, decision and close schools again because they saw that their infection rate went up dramatically. So we are not South Korea by any chance. We're not testing. We don't have the health capacity. I, as a parent, would be very worried about sending my child back to school in Nigeria right now. So we need to think very carefully about that. And then finally, are we complying with the physical distancing rules, no, with the no. decisions to wear masks? I don't think we are. You see lots of pictures with people wearing their mask on their head, on their chin, on their neck. I, we, we really, honestly, in my own sense, I think that the federal government is abdicating its responsibility right now. All right. Um, let's look at some other headlines before we come to uh, Leporeos here. The other one I look at, I'm seeing, is outrage as hoodlums rape, kill Uniben undergraduate in church. Um, we also have a direct, direct or indirect primary. I'll emerge APC candidate, Akere Dolu, um, is speaking. You want to take that on, Boris? Yes. Um, um, uh, I, I don't know why, you know, politicians, like Akere Dolu had said, look, direct or indirect primaries, he's, um, he's sure of the process and confidence of uh, the outcome. Um, in Edo, the governor is running from pillar to posts looking for you know, how to skew the process. He wants an indirect primaries while um, the um, National Working Committee is well, Would that system. actually be fair? Because he also, I, I read a report of him saying that either way, primary or um, direct or indirect, he's confident that he no, is also... No, it's Akere Dolu that had said direct or indirect. The governor in Edo State is insisting on indirect primaries why the National Working Committee is on is insisting on direct primaries. And they had cited the re issues of COVID-19 for why they wanted um, an indirect primaries. And, and so um, he had gone to see the president, had gone to see Tinubu on these issues. So for me, for us to deepen democracy, there's need for transparency and accountability. I, we talked about it you know, in this same studio last week. I, I expect that um, internal uh, um, um, democratic measures should be put in place, you know, in the political parties. So if your process of selecting your candidate is open and transparent, it is easy for, you know, the uh, voters to believe that process and also show that, um, you know, your, 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 their internal mechanism, the internal dem democratic mechanism in your party. And so selling your candidate will, will not be too difficult. But a situation where you want to shroud the process in secrecy of indirect processes that had consistently given political parties problems, if you remember the days of PDP, which was why APC decided to embrace, you know, the option of either direct or indirect. I think that um, both, both governors should be ready to face the, their political party, you know, in, a, in a direct primaries. All right. Uh, we'll go to this day newspaper now um, to quickly wrap things up. Five years on, still on lights, still no lights to see Buhari's power sector achievements. I'll take that again. Uh, business day, business day newspaper. Five years on, still no light to see Buhari's power sector achievements. Okay. Um, we also have here are three steps Nigeria can consider in reopening its economy. That's a suggestion uh, there. You might want to go read it up. Uh, that's just basically the big one this morning on um, business day. And uh, Aisha, I want to. Oh, oh, no light. We've not seen light. Um, people are still complaining in spite of all the efforts at the power sector reform. What's your take? My take is our power sector reform agenda is one of the murkiest, uh, unclear things that are that you know go on in Nigeria, and there's a lot of that that's going on. There's many parts of our sectors that we just don't understand what what the problem is. We've privatized 
our generation and our distribution. We've, we, while this, well, the country has held on, federal government has held on to transmission, but we still have issues. I think it, just as COVID-19 lockdown began in March, we had this viral video of a lady who was literally weeping because of the frustration of no light. The truth is we cannot talk about developing Nigeria, we cannot talk about an alternate uh, economy besides oil and gas without having electricity. Tiwa Savage yesterday trended, she had like over 20,000 tweets in like a few hours because she just says we are tired. And for me, that sums up the issue around the power sector. We are tired, we don't understand, but those are the people who are in, in positions of power and authority should just get on with their jobs. You know these things, people put themselves forward and say they want to lead, they want to be in positions, and they get there and then they still keep complaining and making excuses. I remember when Fashola was the governor of, of, of Lagos State and in opposition, he had made all sorts of remarks about why solving power problems was going to be an easy thing. He got in there and couldn't solve the problem. So for me, it's not to point blame. It's just to say we as ordinary Nigerians, all we care about is to see light. Without light, we cannot develop. But I also want to touch really briefly, I know Felicity, we're out of time, but in thinking about the primaries for Edo State, let's not forget that the governor of Edo and the APC chairman, uh, Oshemole, have been at daggers drawn for almost the entire time of Obaseki's um, tenor, first term. So that will also have implications for why he wants a direct or indirect primary. That said, primaries in Nigeria are one of the most fraudulent things that have ever been done. And it's the reason why by the time voters are voting on, on election day, we're happily waving their PVCs around, we've already lost the battle for decent leadership because we have no say over what the primaries um, yield. And usually that, that process is entirely compromised from beginning to the end. And I can speak with authority as somebody who has actually tried to run for office from primary level and was kicked out. But it wasn't that. It's just the process was eye-shocking and eye-opening. There is no internal party democracy. And honestly, if we don't get primaries right, it would be very hard to improve the talent leadership pipeline that we have in Nigeria right now. Thank you very much, Aisha, for joining us for the newspaper review. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, Liboris, let's uh, your, your two cents on the power situation. Yes, um, it's, um, it's quite unfortunate that um, Buhari came on board. We're talking about um, the problem really with power sector, uh, it's um, the followership. Nigerians, you know, you have leadership and followership problem, but the major problem is followership. We, we pressing leaders rather than tax them to account, hold them to account. When Buhari came on board, rather than, you know, insist that he hit the ground running, we started praising his body language because we had, you know, light for, you know, a few seconds. Everybody started talking about, oh, the president's body language is working. And as we speak now, the government is talking about, you know, a deal with Siemen in Germany. And if you remember the same Siemen, you know, the crisis with Siemens, we didn't investigate, even though some of the people that were involved in that bribery in Nigeria were, were jailed abroad. Government is talking about um, that they are not going to be middlemen. And so what is the deal about? Are they going to come like the Chinese, you know, rather than provide opportunity, take you know, away what we have here? All of these are shrouded in secrecy and mystery. And until we are we're very transparent with our process, until Nigerians also insist that leaders, once you are elected, you make promises, you must pro provide on those promises, until we begin to insist, irrespective of the political party that you belong to, we are just going to be grappling in the dark, and at the end of 20 years from now, we are still not going to have light to see light. I hope not. Thank you very much, uh, Barrister um, Liboros Shema, for coming on the program. Always my pleasure. Thank you. And that's where we wrap things up this morning. I hope you got a better insight to the headlines. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow morning with a look at the papers. My name is Felicity Ezewige. Do take care of yourself.